Well, hello everyone. Eric Chappelle, Community Evangelist for uh, Civil Products here at Autodesk. And I want to welcome you all here for another webcast in our series. I'm happy to announce that I've got Ramesh with me today, and uh, he's going to be our primary presenter. <clears throat> but before we get to that, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. First off, if you're new here, welcome to our um, product team webcast series. We've been doing this um, next Next time we hold a webcast, it'll be officially one year that we started this series. So it's hard to believe a year has passed since the beginning. And uh, since then, we've, with one exception, we've done a webcast twice a month for, uh, for an entire year. So we've uh, collected quite a library, and all of the recordings are available on, uh, on our community site. So you definitely check those out if you haven't been back there. Um, the goal of this webcast series is to inform you about our civil product features, from the perspective of the product team, and today is no exception, Ramesh is a member of our product team with a very deep history in the uh, reality capture and point cloud um, technology that you're gonna that he's gonna talk about. And uh, Ramesh, I hope uh, when it's your turn to talk that you'll give uh, give folks a little idea of your background and where you come from. I think that'll be helpful. Sure. Um, we also it's also a chance for you guys to ask questions, and I'll cover that a little in a little bit more detail later. But generally speaking, we want to bring you guys, the users, closer together with the folks who, who make the software and, uh, and you know, really strengthen that relationship and get a lot of back and forth going there. Um, our next webcast actually have a really big announcement to make here. We are going to see the Dan and Dave show return. And if, if any of you are longtime uh, Civil 3D users, you recall the days, it's actually back around like 2006, 2007, where um, Dan Philbrick and, and Dave Simeone used to do a, a Friday Friday lunchtime webcast. And at the time, Civil 3D was very new, so they were talking about what, the, what, what was going on with Civil 3D from the product team perspective. And um, of course, uh, Dave and Dan are in different roles, uh, although still very, uh, very much integrated with both Civil 3D and InfraWorks 360. So it'll be interesting to see them back and uh, to give us the scoop on what's new in both of those products. Now I want to point out that this is, this is a special day and time. Normally we do this series on Wednesdays. We're actually going to go to a Tuesday, um, it'll be two weeks from now on a Tuesday, April 19th, same time, uh, 12 to 1 Eastern. But please note that the, uh, the day is different. We're going to break out of that Wednesday mold a bit. Um, the links for registering for that webcast are, are going to be out shortly. So um, be sure to uh, watch all the different community um, channels out there, the community site, the forum, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and you'll be seeing information on how to register for that webcast. Um, I also have an announcement to make that we're going to be taking a new approach in general to this webcast series. Instead of just talking about InfraWorks exclusively, we're also going to include the entire civil product suite. And that is primarily going to focus on InfraWorks 360 and Civil 3D, but of course other products are involved as well. So going forward, um, as we continue this webcast series, there are going to be things that are interesting to both Civil 3D and InfraWorks 360 users. So um, if you've got friends out there who maybe have been uh, hanging out on the fence because they're strictly Civil 3D users, now they can log into the series and uh, there's going to be something for them as well. You know, it, it just makes sense. The two products work so well together and there are so many areas where they overlap and, and uh, complement each other that, you know, why, why exclude one or the other? So we're going to talk about the, all of the civil products in this series going forward. So stay tuned for, um, for the topics to come. And, you know, next week, or the next webcast is a great way to kick that off with Dave and Dan, both um, each kind of in charge of, of one of the products and um, getting their take and, and then going forward from there. So a quick poll, um, getting back to kind of the, uh, the InfraWorks topic. Um, we've been doing this poll and it has to do with um, what your current usage level of InfraWorks 360 is. So please um, answer the questions on the screen if you don't mind or answer the question by choosing what your InfraWorks 360 usage level is. So, so far we've got about half of you uh, have voted. Number's going up pretty rapidly though, so <clears throat> I'll leave the poll open for uh, 10 seconds or so. 
it's been really interesting to note the progression down the list as this from when the webcast series started and uh, we're definitely seeing the majority of people in the third and fourth category and right now the um, I regularly use it on some projects is the winner and actually I use it on almost every project we've seen that that segment grow as well that's up to 20 percent so uh, it's been great to see the progression of InfraWorks 360 adoption over the past year. All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll down. Thanks to all of you who provided your input. Um, just another uh, a reminder that I always do on the InfraWorks 360 community, the, the URL that you see on the screen is kind of the central hub, which will link you out to all the things you see listed there, the forum, the idea station. Um, and you know, also as time progresses, you're going to see the right now. You know, we're talking about the InfraWorks 360 community, but you're going to be seeing that community merge together with uh, with Civil 3D as well, and, and that will be a progression over the coming months. Um, a disclaimer, and you know, normally I, I kind of go through this as an exercise, but this time this really applies. Um, what Ramesh is going to be talking about today is a preview feature, and we need to be really clear that. Even though he's going to be covering it, it's not a promise of anything to come, um, and there's really no guarantee that anything that's currently listed as preview or that we talk about as, in, as something we're working on, there's no guarantee that that's going to be in the software until you actually see it in the software. So don't make any purchasing decisions based on what you see today. And um, you know, basically the second bullet point is whatever happens with these features going forward, you know, we're not expressing any kind of obligation. So that's our legal uh, legal speak for for the show. And uh, before we get on with it, I do want to encourage everyone to ask questions. I'm going to be standing by um, checking out the questions window. So as you have questions, please submit them there. Our group is is way too large to open the phone lines. It would just sound like a zoo if we did that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we'll take questions via the questions window. So type away. Um, I think Ramesh plans to have kind of a Q&A session near the end, so um, we may, you know, I might just keep tabs on those questions and save them for that time. We'll just kind of see how it goes. Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to keep it pretty, uh, pretty informal here, so if there's something that's really timely that pops up, I may interrupt Ramesh and, and uh, chime in on it, but uh, please don't hold back on your questions. Um, the more the better. So with that, I am going to make Ramesh a presenter. And he will now be sharing his screen and taking over the presentation. So it's all yours, Ramesh. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Hopefully, you guys can start seeing my screen soon and hear me better. Yes. Um, hi. We are seeing your screen. Hello everyone, um, my name is uh, Ramesh uh, Sridharan and I'll be talking today about the, the Reality Capture Point Cloud Tools um, uh, capabilities we are adding in InfraWorks, especially focusing on the, the main topic, current generation here. Um, I've been working with Point Cloud for past 15-16 uh, years, uh, heavily on mobile, uh, terrestrial, uh, high, high resolution data sets and also on the UAV data sets for the last few years. Uh, so that we can understand what point cloud technology is offering and how it can benefit um, the construction AEC industry, especially uh, from the infrastructure perspective, uh, it can benefit out of it. So today, most of the discussion will be geared towards that. So how to utilize the point cloud data much better. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the call today knows point cloud data one way or the other. It, it's hard to miss because uh, in the last 10 years, at least, the point cloud became uh, one of the main ingredients in any AEC project, as a construction or uh, infrastructure, anything. One way or the other, you use it directly or indirectly. Uh, and it's getting better. Uh, we are, it's very easy to capture nowadays really high resolution data. That's, the good thing is you can actually uh, define the resolution you want when you're doing the project. There are, there are sensors that can actually provide you the information you want. and uh, when you first look at the data, it's a 3D point cloud, 3D pixels, but it carries more information to it. Uh, there are lots, lots of stuff you can extract from it, uh, but most of the time the industry concentrates on only a few of those, but I'll, uh, the one of the uh, ambition we're having is to make sure the point cloud user can use to the fullest. And 
it is getting accurate. That's one of the questions users had like a five years back in the point cloud industry. How good is this? How accurate is this? But now there are lots of projects have been done and it's proven that the point cloud can be made or they're collected accurate so that it can be uh, confidently used in a design and model project. And lots of ways to collect it. Uh, we are going to talk mostly on the high resolution point cloud data today. But the concepts we are talking about, the tools we are talking about today will be applicable for any type of point cloud. So as a user, you can bring in the point cloud data and start using the tool, get the terrain without worrying about what it is and how it is and things like that. So what is the big problem? I just said 20 years point cloud has been there and what's the big problem in the industry now? Uh, the file sizes are too big. Um, it might be, it might not be surprising for many of you on the call. Uh, whenever people talk about the point cloud data, the first thing strikes is, "Wow, it's a terabyte of data. Uh, how am I going to process anything with it?" And, uh, and this being having a large data set makes to, well, go to the other ones like lack of expertise in software sort of functionality, making this point cloud usage a little bit tougher in the community, uh, and it kind of blocking um, uh, to get the fullest of the point cloud data. So we are talking about, uh, we are going to be talking about some of the tools, how to make this easier uh, so that the adaptation and the usage can be much better from user perspective. And the other thing is, the, how are you going to approach this whole problem? Um, because it is large data. It's like showing you, um, you know, gigabytes of data on the screen and letting you do, go ahead, we have, we collected everything, you can do whatever you want. But the question is, how are we going to do that is a big deal. Uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge in the industry, which basically led to the statistics um, recently. So we are coming up with a focus of the vision called points to model. So from a user perspective, user focuses on the models and the design related features that, that user needs to extract from the point cloud data without concern more about the point cloud size and the collection more than all those things. The tools should behave in such a way you bring in the accurate point cloud data and you can get out with the accurate information content of it that leads you and that helps you do your job of designing or modeling as simple as possible. That's the idea, that's the vision we are, we are trying to do here at SOIT as a framework. Uh, so how are we going to do that? The main thing is extract the derivative. The terrain is one of the main derivatives we'll be talking today but there are a few more derivatives you can extract from the point cloud data that directly impacts the 3D modeling and the design workflow. And once we have that, there are lots of analysis tools um, that can be done with the point cloud data, like the clearance and the change detection and all those things. But the basic is the, the having a good hold, a good handle on the point cloud information content that leads to a variety of applications. That's what we're going to be talking today. So what is the derivative? Uh, let's jump into some point cloud data here. So this is um, a typical uh, mobile uh, data. Set. The sensor is on the back of the truck. Uh, in this particular case, the, the collection people are collecting on the most lane. Uh, and the, the sensor basically collected all those points. You can see they are 3D. You see a typical uh, view of the rows. And you also see the RGB values. You see the paint stripes and the yellow stripes in the middle and so on and so forth. And this one is, uh, I think this is about like, you know, not that big a size, like a four or five GB data set uh, in this case. So that's going to be the input. Whether you collect it or whether you get it from someone, when you start using it, that's probably the first view you'll be started seeing from the point cloud data. So the derivative is what we call, the first derivative is a ground. Um, it is very surprising when it comes to um, high resolution data, extraction of the ground, extraction of the terrain, uh, somehow disappear. Uh, before, when we have like okay, 10 years back in which people talk about the airborne or a uh, little bit of a low resolution or medium resolution data, extracting the ground and the contours were the, one of the important aspects of the point clouds. After all, ground is a predominant number of points in any means of uh, point cloud collection. Hey, Ramesh. But when it comes to how to, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we've had a couple of reports that the audio is choppy. I'm wondering if we mm -hmm. couldn't switch you over to uh, a dial-in. It sounds good from where I am, but apparently in some parts of the country it's choppy. So maybe if we go with a, a phone, with phone audio, we'll have better luck. Sure. Actually, I, I already dialed in. Oh, you are dialed in. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we're just going to have to go with it then. I apologize for those of you who are having difficulties, but um, I am recording this. It sounds good on my end, so the recording should be good if you want to come back and, record and re review that later. Sorry, Ramesh. Please continue. Oh, no problem. I'll also talk a little bit uh, slower. Um, okay. So when it comes to a high resolution data, um, there, still there are lots of ground points uh, you see during the collection, when you see the point cloud. But when someone wants to create a terrain uh, out of it, the very common means is extract some break lines and just interpolate between them and create terrains and contours, which is okay. Uh, but the whole idea of having high resolution is to get more details on the ground and um, other features then it looks like we're actually deviating from the main objective and just try to get what we want just because that's all we can. So we are trying to handle that problem by having a capability, simple capability of extracting the ground. Remove all the non-ground points, below ground or above ground, and provide the users with what it is. And of course here you see a lot of um, extremities on both ends, which we can be clipping up the nature of the mobile LiDAR data but the point remains the same that getting the ground or the terrain in, the, um, in this case the road area is one of the vital facts. So how to do that simply? So that's the first derivative. The second one is everything that's sticking out. Um, in this case you can actually see uh, some of the signs, um, very prominent here, there's a street light here and a power line wires going through, uh, even the McDonald sign for that matter. So these are all um, it, the terminology varies, like over points or X topo or the point features or the city assets, but they all in, in one way or the other means exactly the same thing. Uh, these are all the features on my roadside in this case. How can I extract them and represent them with a single point basically? So that's, the, uh, that's one of the main tasks, but here I'm talking about the classification on how to extract these features as a, uh, LiDAR, from the LiDAR data. That's the second uh, uh, derivative. And the third one is pretty straightforward because this all reminds. Once I'm on the road, how to represent, how to get those linear features, like a paint stripes and edge of payments and um, top and bottom of the curves or curb and gutters in other ways, uh, how to get them from the point cloud data. So the, what I'm trying to convey here is when any point cloud data, in this case I'm talking on infrastructure road perspective, but uh, uh, irrespective of the application, maybe I'm using that word loosely here, but to get the point across, irrespective of the application, these three derivatives will act as a real base uh, which will let the user to do something with the point cloud data uh, very easily, very thoroughly uh, as they want. Uh, of course, today's discussion is on uh, terrain generation. I'll be focusing uh, just on that. So, let me go back to the previous slide one more time. So here I'm talking about the classification of point cloud data. And many of you who worked uh, in the point cloud industry uh, for last few years, especially in high resolution, you can see that this is the holy grail. Uh, everyone's trying to do that one way or the other, but most of them are doing manually uh, right now. Uh, but the question remains, I'm showing the classified point cloud data. How can I use it uh, for my modeling purposes in InfraWorks? And how can I possibly use this for my terrain or uh, design purposes in a civil 3D or other software? So what you'll get out of it is a terrain as a model. In this case, uh, this is also mobile LiDAR data, about uh, not that big, like 100, 150 miles of data. Uh, once you have that in the product, when you create the terrain, uh, you'll see, in this case, the software creates a terrain as a geotiff uh, in InfraWorks but it also has some classified point cloud data uh, in point cloud format. Uh, as I mentioned before, in the beginning of the presentation, the tools we added, in this case the terrain generation, is applicable for different types of LiDAR, not just one uh, mobile or a static or one particular sensor even. Uh, it's been made it, uh, as generic as possible. So you can see here, uh, I'm showing the results from various different data sets and the final terrain. Uh, extracted from it. Uh, I brought this slide back one more time uh, because uh, of course I didn't introduce you to the tool. I will give you a demo of that. Uh, but I'll, I will attack the problem of the software functionality and the lack of expertise when I'm giving you the demo. But uh, still, the big elephant in the room is the five sites are still too large to work with. 
how am I going to store, uh, how am I going to share, and what what different we are doing compared to the others. So we added a concept called lightweight point cloud data. That is possible because we have the information context extraction. So the one you see on the left hand side here in of this slide is the original point cloud data. And what you see on the right hand side is what we call as a, a lightweight point cloud data. I want to show it this side by side so that you can first visually confirm uh, they both look pretty much the same. Um, especially, I'm not, I'm not just talking about the regular normal eye view, but even the feature perspective, you can see the, the vertical features and all those things I see here, that the traffic light and uh, the street lights and stuff. I see the same thing here with pretty much the same definition. And the linear features also I see here. So I have pretty much the same thing, but the big difference is that in this case, the file size. So we are storing the information content so that we can represent a 400 megabyte file with uh, just a 40 megabyte of information content. They both are RCS file format. I'm not zipping, I'm not compressing here. They are the file format. So this helps the user. So basically you are still working with the same information content. And just because say, you collected way too much data or you are delivered with way too much data, doesn't mean you have to carry that package all along. You can start extracting the information content here and start working with that information content to get your job done. And possibly, depending upon your uh, the infrastructure and the network, you can you share with your customers or inside your colleagues to get the project done as efficient as possible. That's the idea here. So what's in the product now? Actually, I'll cover this right after my demo. Let me just uh, go back to the product here. There. So, um, so like uh, Eric said, the point cloud processing is a preview feature. When you install the product, you'll see here, you can switch it on to enable it. Uh, have an empty model uh, created for the uh, demo today. So I'm going to add a point cloud, import a point cloud. So let me just, uh, I'll start with this one. It comes as a data source uh, and in power. Uh, usually when you create the RCS part, it's a good idea to have the coordinate system information embedded while you're generating the uh, product. You can actually create the RCS file using our recap software. Um, so it has a tremendous uh, capability on importing different formats, including the main ones like the FLS and the PTS and LAS files. So you can, con you can bring those, convert into an efficient indexed file, which we call as RCS or RCP. Uh, but in this case, I purposefully did not uh, specify the coordinate system. In case if you didn't do it, you can go to the configure window and specify the coordinate system of this particular data. In this case, minus PA83. So I'm going to add that and press close and refresh. So now software knows what coordinate system it is and it imports them. This happens to be a little bit below the C-level data set. So that's why you see a face uh, um, terrain on the top and the data is actually right here. So this this, uh, this act as the main thing. So now you have the point cloud data. Uh, your terrain is right here, but you actually want the original terrain here so that you can start building the 3D model. How can you do that? That's what we're going to try. So let me go to the analysis too. So before showing you uh, the, the actual terrain extraction, let me cover one more thing called on cloud themes. So we added a few more themes uh, that will make your visualization better in the in InPower. Like for example, you are seeing the point clouds by uh, RGB mode, like a colorization by uh, RGB, the camera images. But you can add more of them. Like for example, I want to see by elevation, and you can control the rules and color format. Right there, or I want to see it by, let's say, classification. Any number of classification for you, or the features, however you want to call it. You can again, you can control the colorization. In this case, it's a raw data; nothing is there, so that's why everything is in one color. And also, you can have the uh, intensity. So, so, people who work with the point cloud, you, know, you will understand what I'm talking about here: intensity or the reflectivity of the data set. Right there, 
it help you see some of the, the ground features like a paint stripe and things much clearer. So we added some enhancements to this. So you can actually view it by team. The general experience of the point cloud is much better uh, in the product now, uh, especially when it comes to large point cloud data. So we jump to terrain generation. So this point cloud that terrain tool, uh, the software automatically loads all the data sources you have, the point cloud data sources, and we are coming with the default options as the optimum. For any regular user, you can choose the optimum software user set to process the point cloud data. For a little bit advanced user, or you want more out of the terrain, you can add some less detail or more detail to get what you want. Or for really advanced user, you want to get exactly what you want, there are advanced settings options, you can specify that will give you more control over the classification and the terrain uh, that's being extracted. Like for example, we want to fill the uh, terrain holes or not. Some customers like it, some customers don't. You can control those kind of behaviors automatically here. And uh, somewhere I mentioned about the lightweight, uh, we still provide as a choice. So you can still create the original point cloud data. Some customers like to deal with uh, uh, actual point cloud just because they're either comfortable with it or they feel that has more uh, information content in it, which is fine. So we have the choice to do that here. Or we also have the lightweight as an option. You can choose it. Or we can even have something called a key point. So it will have a very sparse uh, point, uh, surface, but it will carry a lot of information content as well. Uh, so you can do that. The file size was large, uh, medium, small, and other things. In this case, I'm going to choose the uh, lightweight and uh, you can override it. If you have large point cloud data, you don't want, if you want to keep two copies of it to see how it was put before and after, I can switch this off. Software will put automatically in a new proposal. But if you want it to just override the original one, you're fine with it. You can save some disk space. Then I can switch it on. Everything will go back into the same match of proposal uh, I am in right now. So I'm going to click stop costing. So while this is costing, any questions? Eric, is anything popping up? Yeah, Ramesh, we had a couple of questions regarding kind of performance. Um, and and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you both of these because they kind of tie together. The first one was how big can the point clouds be to have reasonable mm -hmm. performance? And then what would be the workflow for a 10 to 20 mile highway segment? Do you split it into smaller pieces, extract surfaces, and merge into InfraWorks? How, how would you handle that? Sure. So the, uh, we are large point cloud data, the software actually takes, we call it like a virtual tiling kind of a thing. The software takes it and process them uh, based on your RAM uh, capability of your machine and uh, uh, and your data set size, obviously. And if you if you have a machine based on the InfoWorks specification, the software can process a large data. Uh, we have processed uh, uh, about like 120, no, uh, 210 uh, GB of data set each, the large uh, bunch of RCS files, and each of them may be about a, a gig or a two gig or something like that uh, to make up the project. We can process it so the software can get the job done. For the large projects, you don't have to explicitly split it. Uh, I, uh, most of the time when you get the data from the sensor, uh, depending upon the sensor obviously, but most of them are doing a good job on letting you trim them to like a half a GB or one GB layer file. Uh, which is perfectly fine. You can bring it in. Uh, we have tested with some sensor data which used to create like a 20 or 30 GB file, one file with 30 GB. We have tested that also, uh, even though that sensor is no longer doing like that, they are also creating a 1 GB, 2 GB file. So, which is fine. You don't have to cut into smaller ones and specifically, you don't have to cut into tiles. Uh, that's, uh, that's an unnecessary step. You are literally duplicating the data. We have like a 10, like for example here, we have collection one and collection two. You can process both separately. Or I mean, what, what I mean, you can get those two RCS files and you can actually uh, create the terrain instead of you create, uh, uh, make a tiles out of it and then you basically duplicating the data and then do it. You don't have to go through the trouble. Uh, you can bring in the actual data you want to use in the project and get it done. Okay, great. Uh, we had a couple of questions about lightweight mode. So what determines mm -hmm. what points are kept or discarded? Or another question very similar, how many points are dropped for lightweight mode? Sure. So the, the lightweight mode, the, the content is basically that. Now, like a stone, if you go back to my slide, maybe I should go back to my slide to get that. 
how we can cure, for example. So uh, the idea here, the idea behind the light weight is, uh, you can always have the original point of data. But once you have the information content, like I'm showing here all these red ones and all those multicolored ones, the remaining are essentially a bunch of uh, ground points. Uh, but depending upon your purpose, it may be redundant or it may have too much data depending upon your collection. So the lightweight will carry all the vertical features here and all the linear features and some amount of the, um, uh, the sur surface point. What do we mean by some amount? When we talk to our customer before we started adding this tool, uh, they are basically asking, how are you creating the surface? Like I said, in the beginning, they mostly do, this, do that with, uh, go through a painful process of extracting the, the line work and then interpolate it, so they're not directly based on the surface. Then I ask them, let's pretend that you have a capability, so you can actually create the terrain, triangulated surface from the point cloud data. So different software behave differently, but for some reason the magic number is two to two and a half million points if they have it on, the, on, your, um, on your surface the triangulation process works much better pretty much across the board in the LiDAR industry uh, for the triangulated surface generation. So we kind of optimize that in this case, when you create the lightweight, you will have around 2 million points on the surface, on the ground, and the remaining are the vertical features that popping up from the ground. So you get both the benefits. You are not losing the information content. At the same time, you have enough points, not more, not less, enough points to create a triangulated surface uh, for your processing purpose. That's a key there. And what, what uh, let's just answer the other question also. What, uh, uh, what is there and what works? Like I said, some of the surface goes, but most of the, what we call as the linear and the vertical features stays uh, in the lightweight also. So the, the a related question is, <clears throat> would you say that this is similar to the process, uh, the, the simpli simplified surface, the point reduction op option in Civil 3D, would you say it's similar to that? Uh, uh, if you take the information content away from it, uh, it will be relatively sim uh, similar because uh, kind of like a subsample surface. The idea the lightweight become stronger is not just the subsample and simplified ground. It can augment that with other information content that makes it a little bit powerful. But if you're going to talk about just the, the point perspective, uh, like a number of points perspective, they are similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this should be much, much better. Sorry. A couple other questions, if you don't mind, Ramesh. Um, is this a cloud hmm. service of, of, you know, extracting the terrain? Uh, we, we are thinking about it. The one you catch is the point cloud side. The input point cloud are so huge. Um, if you're going to be in the cloud, if you're going to upload it to the cloud, by the time you upload it, you might as well, might you get that in your local right. machine itself. So it depends on the size. So it, currently everything works, uh, runs on the desktop. Uh, we are considering the cloud depending upon the uh, situation. We, we are trying to make that. Uh, question, can the raster part of the point cloud be added as part of the terrain? Yeah, absolutely. So the raster we are creating, which leads me to the uh, software which is created. So the, the, the actually, well, I, I, Probably I should have asked a follow-up question. What do you mean by the raster? The raster as a geotiff or raster as the RGB they are looking at? I'm going to guess it's the it's the color the colors out of the point cloud. Can those be extracted and draped on the on the terrain as an image? Got it. Got it. So uh, the answer is no because the color there are two different types of rasters. One is the geotiff rasters uh, x and y select and y where the, the, the visual pixel values carry the elevation for the geotiff so that it's a 3D uh, raster which contains the elevation information. The other types of rasters are purely visual, like an image where X and Y are again X and Y, the pixel values carry the visual content of it. And this tool creates the 3D geotiff. So it creates the Z value uh, for the pixels so that it's a terrain and elevated DEM information in short. So it won't have the raster of the colorization although we are thinking about adding that the capability in future. Okay. Um, one last question just popped up. Is there a way to edit the terrain surface if there is some noise that isn't filtered properly? Uh, we, we, we might be adding the terrain editing. It's, we don't want to add too much of the editing tool um, in the infrared and in general from the point of perspective. The whole idea is to make it as simple as possible. 
um, uh, but uh, we might be adding it. it. It all depends upon your purpose. If you want to talk about the introverts uh, modeling perspective and uh, and whatever you're doing in introverts here, you can actually do that without editing. You have the control over doing that. But if you're going to take it to civil 3D for a little more design purposes, you can probably edit a little bit there and create a triangulated surface. And also, if you're not happy with the terrain, uh, let's say you carried too much information or less information, you, you always have an option of coming back and just quickly rerun it like a more detailed, less detailed, that will take care of some of your uh, uh, noise eliminations as well. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw something in here and you tell me if this is correct or incorrect, but I'm thinking if, if you had a part on the surface that kind of popped up because a feature wasn't filtered out properly, you could you could always throw a coverage on that and kind of flatten it down. I'm thinking, is that a way of, That's correct. if you had a, just a, a spot or two that needed doctoring, that would work? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. All right. That's it for the questions for now. So um, please continue. Perfect. So this one, we just ran that uh, terrain generation process. Um, so you can already see uh, this is point cloud data. I'm going to switch on my the features just to show you that remember I showed you when I first started, it was all the same uh, same monotonous color. Now I see multicolored stuff, uh, recognizing or they basically classifying each and every feature. But that's not the main intention of this demo. This, uh, this presentation is about the terrain. So you also see lots of uh, uh, the brown uh, ground point, uh, which you can, by the way, control it also. If you want to see just that uh, ground. I just editing it, but you can create a new team. I think it's a, I'll make it one to three. Okay, ground is in second. There we go. I'll make it a little bit better. So Perfect. So you can actually see that the software removed all the ground points, especially the, the focus here is from um, the curb to curb uh, because the, most of the mobile LiDAR, in this case, the mobile LiDAR processing, uh, people will be trimming, as far as the surface is concerned, people might be trimming the things away from the road because it's uh, for various different reasons. Uh, from edge of payment, edge of payment or curb to curb, in this case, you can actually see that software process, the terrain uh, generation in this case. And if I switch it off, and switch off the point cloud as well. The software created a geotiff terrain, which actually here is a raster uh, data source. So now you actually remember we, um, how when you open the point cloud data, the data was below the sea level, so we have the the default or the fake terrain way up there. When you want to create a model for the city modeling, you, you can do that. It doesn't fit right. You may have to do a delta Z or something that unnecessary steps in your workflow. But now, once you have the actual terrain from your point cloud data, and terrain is as accurate as your uh, point cloud you bring in, so now you have the terrain information, you can add and create a city model right here that's going to give you exactly what you want. That's the main purpose here. And at the same time, uh, this is a raster image. Uh, you can export it to IMX or the SQLite. You can open it in Civil 3D. You can use this terrain in Civil 3D also uh, to do your uh, terrain or surface related uh, um, operations. Or if you're a little bit advanced user, the processed RCS file is actually stored uh, in the point cloud folder. So if you open it, if you open right here. So there is RCS file in this case. Uh, this is processed one, it has the ground point, uh, processed point data. You can take this and you can import this into the city directly and you can triangulate them or you can do whatever you want there as well. So both the choices are available for you. Um, any questions, Eric, on this? We had a couple of questions about feature extraction. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, mm -hmm. talk about that at all. Uh, not right now. This session is about the terrain generation. That's what's in the product right now. I think uh, we'll stick to that. Part. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so so you can see here, the, the idea again here is you bring in the point cloud data, the interface is very simple uh, for for all purpose, uh, purpose of extracting it and with a few clicks you can actually create the terrain from the point cloud data. And I'll, I'll stress one more time, in this uh, um, example we are using the infrastructure as a base, uh, or roads in this case, as a base data, but the concept of creating the terrain and the lightweight and all those things are applicable 
uh, pretty much throughout. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the indoors buildings and pipelines and those kind of things, but uh, in general for the parking lots or the railroads or the power lines and all those kind of applications, you can use the same tool and get those certain information and start building accurate uh, pin forward models, the idea here. Uh, I'm going to go back, complete my few slides. There you go. So what's in the product now? Um, so enhanced visualization. So much uh, much more data can be brought in. And there are a few more uh, settings for the other product. I can actually show you that also. So if you go to the uh, application options for the point cloud, uh, you can actually, depending upon your uh, machine, most of the customers use the, the machine that's recommended by the Infowars uh, um, the specification. Some use a little bit of lower RAM or something like, for example, if you want, if you want to work with 64 bit operating system with 4 GB RAM, that's already small. Uh, it's hard to do something with it. But if that's what you have, you still want to do it, there are some options to do like a point cloud slider and the density you can control to that will work closely with your, uh, uh, your, your machine and try to get the better performance as much as possible. So uh, we enhance the visualization and we added more themes like the one I showed you, elevation and the intensity. Uh, that's one more uh, theme called elevation and intensity. You can merge both. Uh, let me show that too. That's actually here. Sometimes it comes very handy when you work with a project like here. I'm going to call it just ENI. Uh, you can control most of the rules and stuff, but the bottom line is I switch on. Uh, you can actually see, yes, specifically you can actually see here. You get the elevation content, you know where the curve and everything. At the same time, you see the paint stripes on the road. So it's kind of best of both worlds at the same screen. Helps you a lot uh, when you make some decision, uh, uh, on visualization decision, basically. So a lot more so themes are available. And we added a simple capability of extracting the terrain from the uh, any type of point cloud data. Um, well, let's say we're talking about more of mobile in this case. There are lots of high-resolution UAV data comes in. We can also use that and we have a very quick workflow on creating the terrain and start using it. And some of the feature classification, the reason I pointed that out is it, uh, those RCS files are available in the point cloud resource folder. Uh, you can take that in and do something with it also uh, depending upon your application. And uh, one of the important things is the lightweight point cloud data for the customers who want to uh, get the smaller size point cloud but without losing any information, this acts as a big boon um, to get the job done. Okay. And we're going to be there in a SPAR conference next week. And if any of you there, uh, we can also uh, have a face-to-face -face discussion to get more information if you want. Maybe went a little bit fast. Any other questions? Um, there, there were a couple of questions in regards to brake lines, and I think, uh -huh. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the answer to that is kind of that with point cloud data, the data itself is so accurate, you really don't need brake lines. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, some customers uh, are okay. It depends on what type of, well, I shouldn't say what type of brake line. Brake lines are a brake line. That's not a different type. But, uh, but some users like to extract these paint stripes um, as a part of the line work. In that case, yes, having the point cloud high resolution, uh, point cloud helps a lot. But if you're going to talk about the, the top and bottom of the curve, then the point cloud can actually miss some of them. Like here, uh, the car might be uploading in this case. Or even the mere thing, it might actually miss those things. So the brake line extraction um, is uh, it's still there. You cannot get away from it and until the point cloud gets much better and better. Uh, from the workflow perspective, that whatever we are doing here, it leads to that. Since we are focusing on terrain generation, I'm sticking to the terrain generation now. But like I said, once you have the RCS file, especially the lightweight one, now you can take that into your design software, or Excel 3D in this case, and start extracting the line work much easier. Previously, you had too many points to bring it in. Uh, it might be a little bit hard or a little bit, you know, when you have buildings and all those things, it's very hard to see, uh, switch it off and switch it on. But now once you have the classified point of data, you can control uh, what you want to see, like I'm, if I want to switch on just the features on the ground, I can switch it on, I can extract it. It makes your process of extracting those line work in Civil CD much like a breeze. 
Okay, great. <clears throat> that's actually, um, that's the extent of the questions that we had. Um, you know, it may be, this may typically be something you cover in the beginning, but um, Ramesh, would you mind sharing a little bit on your background and, and where you come from? Oh, definitely. So, um, I've been working with the Pond Talk for quite some time. Um, uh, I was working for a company called the Virtual Geomatic. Uh, we created a standalone software uh, focusing mainly on the information content and how to get the valid features out of it, specifically for roads, but we worked with uh, the railroads and power lines also. Um, the technology became part of the Autodesk uh, um, a few years back, and so I'm trying to do a similar thing, but in a much bigger scale, like here. Now we can do a 3D modeling from the point cloud data, uh, change the whole paradigm in the point cloud industry, and that's what we are doing. So I've been messing with point cloud data quite some time. I, I work with uh, many devotees uh, very closely, on especially in point cloud uh, uh, processing, and also the design and the uh, conception forms as well. All right, great. Thank, thanks for uh, providing that information. I'm going to switch myself back to presenter, and I just want to remind everyone before we convene that um, we have our webcast coming up on April 19th, the return of the Dan and, J and Dave show, and these guys are going to be talking about what's new in both InfraWorks 360 and Civil 3D. So this is a historic uh, event on on quite a few fronts. First of all, just the return of, of uh, the old classic Dave and Dan show, uh, not to mention the uh, learning about what's new in the software in, in both of those products. And then also don't forget that going forward we're going to be focusing on the whole civil product suite from now on. So not just InfraWorks 360 but also Civil 3D and and possibly some other products that um, that fit into whatever topic we're we're covering at that time. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for coming. Hope you enjoyed the webcast. It has been recorded. It will be posted up to the community site within a couple of hours. Um, so you can uh, review it up there or share the link with anyone you know who may have, have missed it. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you, Ramesh. Great presentation. And uh, you all go out there and have a great time with, um, with terrain extraction from Point Clouds in InfraWorks 360. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone.